hello. Your, your, your head is cut off a bit. Oh, really? Well, maybe that's a good. No, no, no. It's better now. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Brett Premack, and I'm joined today by my associate, Willard Jenkins. Hi, Willard. Hey, Brett. How are you? All right. We're doing a show called Jazz Talk Squared. And uh, we're not going to be afraid to voice our opinions, speak the truth as we see it. Today's topic is the NEA Jazz Masters Award Show, which happened this past Monday night at Lincoln Center in New York. Willard was lucky enough to be there, and I watched it uh, streaming on the web. And I've also watched it another time uh, on demand. And... Uh, Willard, since you were there, could you describe the pre-show environment? Well, the pre-show environment was, um, if you're familiar at all with uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, uh, they have this large uh, lobby space, vestibule, however you want to characterize it, uh, in between the elevator and uh, the Allen room where the event took place. And they had a dinner uh, prior to the prior to the event uh, for all the masters and their guests. So that was all set up in that lobby. And uh, the dinner, same with uh, the, the 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 group photo shoot that they always have earlier in the day, is an excellent opportunity for you know, great masters to connect, uh, some of whom may not have seen each other uh, for, for many moons. And so there's a real feeling of reminiscence in the air. And uh, you, you, you overhear a lot of great stories. And, uh, you know, just the folks connecting and enjoying each other's company. Well, that's a beautiful thing. It's always uh, fun when musicians get together and laugh and uh, share stories. We both know what a groove it is to, to be hanging out and be part of that. Uh, yeah, and especially, and especially musicians, most of whom have been performing for over 40 or 50 years. Right. Well, these are, these are masters here. Certainly. Yes, absolutely. How many of the 100-plus uh, jazz masters, I think it's 177 at this point, how many were actually present at the event? You know, that's, that's hard to say, and, and I, I would guesstimate there were anywhere from 50 to 75 of them there. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of them. Of course, when we watch the event... Uh... But, but then again, maybe I'm overestimating, but uh, there were a good number of them there. Okay, well, certainly when we watched the event on the web, we saw some people in the audience. We saw uh, Jimmy Heath. And uh, Roy Haynes. Uh, yeah, they were sitting right. They were sitting right in the same room. Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were uh, uh, very prominent. Uh, uh, before we go into the details of the show here, let's mention that this is really the only major celebration of jazz uh, that's broadcast live like this. This type of award ceremony and other, and other art forms or the. the if, if you call movies an art form, which I do, there's the Academy Awards and the Golden Globes and for TV, the Emmys and the Country Music Awards and for the general music industry, the Grammy Awards. But this is really the only uh, jazz awards program that goes out, except for the annual uh, Jazz Journalist Association Jazz Awards. Uh, yeah, this is this 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 is the only jazz specific uh, awards program that uh, is totally dedicated to the art form other than the JJA awards program. There was some talk last year that with funding cutbacks, the program might be in jeopardy. In fact, uh, the man who's been running the program for a number of years now, who's done a fantastic job, Wayne Brown, has uh, tendered his resignation. What are your thoughts, Willard, on, on the actual future of the NEA Jazz Masters program? Well, you know, uh, let me let me back up. Let's back up a bit. Wayne Brown, yes, he did indeed resign his position at the NEA, but he resigned his position to take another position. Uh, so it's not as so when you characterize it as Wayne resigning his position, I think some people might take that the wrong way. Uh, and 
might suggest that there was some rancor involved in his leaving, and there wasn't. It was a very happy situation for him, he and his wife. Uh, he has returned to Detroit, and he's running the Detroit Opera. And, you know, I met Wayne Brown years ago when we both served on an NEA grants panel. And at that time, you know, over 20 years ago, at that time, he was the uh, executive director of the Louisville Symphony. So Wayne Brown is someone who comes from the European classical world, but who served as, a, a, as an excellent guardian of the jazz flame at the National Endowment for the Arts during his tenure. And uh, it's, it's largely through, due to his tireless efforts of uh, uh, kind of following the directives of originally the, the, the former chairman of the NEA, Dana Joya, uh, in terms of uplifting the uh, visibility of the NEA Jazz Masters program to the point where it is now where they have this big annual program. Uh, you'll recall years ago, the, IA, the, the IAJE conference served as the host for the annual NEA Jazz Masters program. But in the last few years, it's been a standalone program at Lincoln Center, and it's been a, a very successful and very warm tribute to these great masters. Absolutely. Uh, do you think it will continue? You know, that's a good question. That's always a question when you think about anything, not just the NEA Jazz Masters, but when you consider anything at the National Endowment for the Arts. And that's because, unfortunately, oh, we have so many short-sighted politicians who, if there is a perception of tight economic times, even just a perception of tight economic times, we know what the first things to go in terms of funding support are, and that is arts and humanities. And, uh, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts has been endangered by politicians going over two decades ago back to the Robert Maplethorpe uh, uh, controversy during the Reagan administration. That was, a, a, that was a controversy that was largely ginned up by conservatives, and they, I think they, they licked their chops and saw that as a way to try and eliminate the National Endowment for the Arts. Fortunately, they were not successful in eliminating it altogether, but they did enact very deep cuts and have continued to chip away at the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, Obama appointed chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, a man who has since resigned his position, uh, he made a proposal to Congress to fold the NEA Jazz Masters uh, Awards into kind of an overall omnibus American Arts Awards. And uh, that would have meant really only perhaps one jazz master per year being honored along with others from other performing arts fields like the, like the opera and the classical music, chamber music, etc. Uh, fortunately, that particular effort ran into roadblocks and the signal was clear from Congress that they must maintain the NEA Jazz Masters program. I, I, I don't know for certain, but I have to think that perhaps John Conyers' voice was very prominent in that uh, derailment of his plans. So we do still have the National Endowment for the Arts Jazz Masters program, but we're not certain how long it will last or how in what shape it will last because because one of the things that did happen in the recent last two years was that the number of masters who were honored every year was cut down, was cut from six to four. Okay, well, we, we've noted that. Many people wonder who chooses the NEA Jazz Masters. We know that there's a process you can go on the website and nominate someone, but how are the masters actually chosen? Well, the masters are chosen... Uh, as you suggested, through a nomination process 
from the American public, meaning that anyone, uh, any American, can make a nomination of a jazz master through the NEA Jazz Masters website, through that information you suggested. Once a master is nominated, and the nomination process is a very simple process. Uh, it, it, it is no more than a one-page letter. It's not as though you have to nominate someone and submit a whole lot of supporting materials to support your nomination and to verify that who it is you're nominating is indeed worthy of being considered. So once, a, once an artist is nominated for an NEA Jazz Masters Award, I believe it's six years that they stay in nomination. They don't have to be re-nominated. They don't have to be, they don't, you don't have to have a groundswell of support or a petition effort or, 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 you know, dozens and dozens of support letters. It's, it's a one-time nomination. And once a master is nominated, they stay in nomination for, I believe it's approximately six years. And then the, the, uh, People who are actually tasked with naming the NEA Jazz Masters each year uh, are a panel of experts from the field. And those experts from the field include musicians and include NEA Jazz Masters themselves. So I can assure you that the panel that selects NEA Jazz Masters are people who are deeply immersed in this music. Okay, well, let's go to the, to the first... Uh... NEA Jazz Master this year, who, who just happens to be our friend uh, Jamie Abersold, Abersold, excuse me, who got the uh, the uh, Jazz Advocate uh, Award. Yeah, the, the, the A.B. Spellman Jazz Advocate Award. The A.B. Spellman Jazz Advocate Award for his work in jazz education. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamie has, uh, his claim to fame are his, his play-alongs that musicians all over the planet are using. And he's told me several times that there's not one second in the day that goes by without someone somewhere on the earth actually using uh, one of those play along recordings. Uh, yeah, he said that. He said that he made that point at the, the award show. Yes. His, uh, his speech was rather lengthy, I would say. In fact, uh, uh, as a rule, it seems that most of these speeches uh, they're not like the Academy Awards where they get 30 seconds or whatever and then the, the music starts. They can really talk as, they, as long as they want to talk. But uh, I kind of felt with Jamie's thing, I, I thought back to that uh, when Coltrane was with Miles, he played these long solos and, you know, they just went on and on. And someone said, well, why are you playing? He said, I don't, you know, why are you playing so long? I don't know when to stop. So Miles looked at him and said, Take the horn out of your mouth. Take the horn out your mouth, right? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I felt with Jamie's speech. What did you think? Well, of you know, well, you know, first off, you know, I agree. He went on over long. I mean, he had he had he had he had meticulous notes which he read from, and he reiterated some of the information that had already been conveyed in his introductory video. Each of them have a video tribute that precedes their acceptance speech. Uh, but you know, I, I, my understanding is that the producer of the NEA Jazz Masters event has made no bones about the fact that that this is their show, and basically, it's open ended as far as how long they go. It's up to them. But you know, what happens in a program like this? You often find is almost a succession of one-upsmanship. In other words, if the first person, the, the first person is the tone setter, and that was James, that happened to be Jamie Abersall based on alphabetical order. So he went on and on and on, like you said, and I think maybe it either empowered or somehow enabled the other masters to feel like, oh, it's okay for me to run off at the gyms as long as I want. And so <laughs> that's what happened. We had a succession of overlong speeches. Yes, and uh, uh, Jamie's a wonderful man. In fact, I had breakfast with him a few days before the uh, the event at the, the Gen Conference, and you know, 
he's very even keeled midwestern kind of guy happy right. to get the award but then jamie doesn't really have a big ego i mean certainly he's helped a lot of people he's made a contribution to the music but he doesn't well, he's made an enormous contribution to jazz education and richly deserves this award based on his work in jazz education yeah. Okay, well, let me ask you a pointed question here. Did you feel that because of his his noted work in jazz education that he had to play as well, which he did after his speech? You know, I'm going to be honest with you here. And I guess you could say brutally honest, some might say. But my sense of it was and is that the person who is selected as an advocate and he, that A.B. Spellman Award is specifically geared to honor advocates in a variety of different ways, but people who have worked on, in behalf of jazz beyond the performance stage. So Jamie Abersall was this year's advocate selection. And to me, even if an advocate does play, my feeling is that he or she was not selected as a jazz master on the basis of their playing. I mean, we understand that Jamie Ebersol is a player. He's a, he's a skilled saxophonist. But to be quite honest, with all the great mastery in the room and all of the fine young musicians that they brought to the stage to perform with masters, I don't think we needed Jamie Ebersol to play. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Well, I would agree with you on that one. Uh, we didn't need Jamie Ebersole to play. Now, you alluded to uh, a presentational element of the program, and that's in between uh, the celebration of the Masters. There was music played by a combination of Masters and young musicians, uh, winners of the Monk competition on various instruments. What did you think of those musical elements of the program? Uh, the musical elements, I thought, were, were wonderful. I enjoyed all of the performances, with the possible exception of Jamie Abersall, uh, but I enjoyed all of the performances, uh, and, and, and the musicians, I thought, uh, performed quite well. Uh, I had no, no argument with any of the live music. Okay, well, let's move on to our... Uh... Our second uh, nominee, second uh, celebrated artist, and that is uh, Mr. Anthony Braxton. Now, yes. Mr. Mr. Braxton and, uh, started in jazz in uh, the uh, branch of the jazz tree called the Avant Garde. Certainly, uh, I can relate a, a little. I can relate a little st Anthony Braxton story here. After Chick Corea left Miles Davis in the late 60s and early 70s, I guess it was 69 or 70, he went, he, Dave Holland, the bassist of the band, also left at the same time. They formed a group called Circle with the drummer Barry Altschul and Anthony Braxton. And I happened to be at the New York premiere of Circle at the Village Vanguard uh, one night. And uh, Mr. Braxton's uh, saxophone playing was really on the outer edge, really someplace else. And he was playing, and then the music stopped for a moment. The musicians gathered themselves. An elderly woman walked down the steps of the vanguard, and she asked the keeper at the door, is the music very avant-garde? As soon as she <laughs> asked the question, Braxton went into one of his X27-352 YZ wah! solos <laughs> she spun around went right back up the stairs so 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 the keeper at the door he didn't have to answer the question right he didn't he was speechless he didn't yeah braxton uh, answered the question for him right yes uh, as he was wanted to do so uh mr braxton uh, since then has made somewhat of a reputation for himself as an academic he, he uh, has indeed Spent many years at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, mm -hmm. I know a number of students who went there and, and really enjoyed study with him. And uh, recently retired from that. Doesn't really do very much playing. But uh, what did you what what did you think of his, his speech? And what did you think of the musical pre presentation afterwards? Well, first off, he's another one who went over long in his acceptance speech. But 
there was an interesting element, an interesting undercurrent to his remarks. First off, they were extremely heartfelt because at one point he, 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 he shed a couple of tears. Uh, and there was a sense, you got the sense from his remarks that his remarks were about, in part at least, about belonging. In other words, I know there are some people who may be opposed to the music I make, or who may not be into the music I make, and there are those who say that you have to swing in order to truly be a jazz musician. And he said, he made a point of, I don't swing. Uh, but because of the various elements of his career and the various things that he's done, uh, I thought that he was very deserving of the award. And again, his remarks w were very heartfelt and uh, uh, off the cuff. I didn't see him using any notes, and he certainly wasn't watching the teleprompter. Um, but, you know, again, following in the footsteps of Jamie Ebersold, I guess he took license to go on and on and on in his acceptance speech. But, you know, I, I, but, but I think that, first off, it was, it, was, it was good that he got the award from Muhal Richard Abrams. And I think the fact that the two of them have now been awarded is, is, is excellent on behalf of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians in Chicago. Uh, they are two very prominent members of the AACM, and uh, I, I appreciate the fact that the AACM has been honored by the two of them being justifiably elevated as NEA Jazz Masters. So I certainly appreciate it. The fact and supported the fact that Anthony Braxton was honored in that way. His Anthony. music, his music, which followed, uh, had a real operatic quality to it. In fact, it was almost like a comic operatic quality in some cases in terms of the vocal exchange between the male and the female vocalist. The male and the female vocalist, two singers who obviously come out of an operatic tradition. In, 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 in fact, the great Martina Arroyo was at the event. You know, she had just received the Kennedy Center honors and was a friend of Wayne Brown. So I guess uh, he, she, she sat at his table uh, that evening. And afterwards, I saw the male singer in Braxton's piece embracing Martina Arroyo and chatting, chatting her up. Uh, so he comes from the operatic uh, field, as does the female vocalist. And, and uh, Braxton also had a couple of, uh, I guess, younger musicians who could be considered some of his most successful students, uh, such as the trumpeter Taylor Ho Bynum and the always inventive and interesting guitarist Mary Halverson uh, was also in the, in the ensemble. But it was, it was Braxton's composition. And uh, I thought it worked well for the program. Yes, uh, certainly representative of, of his work, no doubt about that. Yes. Uh, good to be included because jazz is an umbrella that includes many different things. It is. Uh, you are absolutely right. And it's important that we recognize all parts of our community. Speaking and it's important. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's definitely important that we recognize the so-called cutting edge or avant-garde, but you know what, that, that term avant-garde is so tired because people like Muhal and Braxton, they've been playing uh, on the outer edges for over 40 years. I mean, how long does one stay avant-garde, you know? Yeah. So that's, a, that's a good question. Now, as long as we're covering all the different aspects of the umbrella, I found one bit of programming a bit odd, and that was, it was either before Braxton or after, the number uh, sang by Anne Hampton Calloway, who I think of as kind of a cabaret singer. Did she seem out of place there, or was it just me? She didn't seem out of place at all to me, especially given the selection she sang, which was Antonio Carlos Jobim's Wave. Uh, Anne Hampton Calloway has a, has a gorgeous voice. Let's start with that. She has a gorgeous voice, and you're right, she is identified somewhat with cabaret, but she has also sung jazz on many occasions. 
So I, I found I found her to be entirely appropriate for the program. Well, I didn't. I somehow found, <laughs> I found her to be. Oh, okay. Well, what was your issue with Anne Hampton Calloway? I just, I found it, it seems like she was just put in there. It didn't seem an organic part of the program. It's a, well, let's get this, let's, let's get this white girl in here and let her sing a bossa nova. You know, I didn't get it. What can I tell you? You know, I, I, I you know, there were there. I, I know that there were a lot of people sitting around me who thoroughly enjoyed her. Uh, there were some people sitting uh, immediately next to me who had never heard her before, who leaned over to me and asked who she was. And uh, my wife, who was sitting next to me, talked about how gorgeous Anne Hampton Calloway's instrument is. She says she has a beautiful instrument, and uh, you know. Come on, Antonio Carlos, Joe Bean, Wave. Uh, why doesn't that belong on a jazz program, Brett? Okay, well, you know, <laughs> one man, one man's, one man's Albert Eiler is another's Kenny G. You know what can I tell you? I hear you. But that's let's, why we love. That's why we love this music, right? That's why we do. You know, there's right. there's something something for everyone. Exactly. And I'm glad that uh, the cabaret jazz people had a, some representation. <laughs> they had their moment, huh? Uh, perhaps I would have cast someone else in that role. But uh, Anne Hampton, please, to, Anne Hampton Kelly, please, no hate mail. You know, maybe we could meet at some future time. Who knows? <laughs> um, let's move on to our next honoree, one that I thoroughly enjoyed, both. Uh, his uh, his remarks and his uh, bass solo, and that's Richard Davis. Yes. Richard Davis, uh, who is now 83 years old, has been uh, part of the jazz world for, for, uh, since the 60s, and uh, very happy to uh, see that he was celebrated. And I thought one of the, the most joyful moments in the program came when Richard was talking about uh, going to the University of Sarah Vaughan uh, in the early 60s, and playing with Roy Haynes, and lo and behold, there was Roy Haynes in the audience. They made eye contact at one point, and they just both laughed for about two minutes. I mean, it was That was great. Little, that was great. And, that, that and, and also, the whole aspect of bringing Sarah Vaughan into the house was a beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it's a, this music is built on the, uh, the musical foremothers and forefathers like Sarah Vaughan, and they're no longer with us. Their music is eternal, but uh, I think it's important that uh, we celebrate them. And also, it was touching to see that uh, that communication between Richard and Roy, don't you think? Oh, yeah, it was. It was. That, that's the kind of thing that happens throughout this evening, that moment of recognition, that Man, I haven't seen you in 20 years, that kind of aspect, you know, that beautiful reminiscence and, and, that, and that, that, you know, reunion aspect of the NEA Jazz Masters program is really one of the hallmarks of that evening. Absolutely. And our final Jazz Master was Mr. Keith Jarrett. Now, I, uh, I've been a Keith Jarrett fan for many years of his music. Uh, the man himself. I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to judge him. I know that he likes audiences to be quiet and won't won't think twice about uh, stopping a concert if you see someone uh, taking a photograph. Well, did you did did did, 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 did you dig George Weens? George Weens in the letter that George Weens sent uh, as his intro to Keith Jarrett in absentia because George couldn't be there, uh, and there was one line in that letter that was priceless. I said Keith Jarrett never heard a cough he didn't recognize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, you know, it was interesting to have Keith Jarrett and Anthony Braxton honored on the same program because there are those among us, among we, the jazz community and the jazz fans will probably think either, neither or both of them deserve that award. I, for one, support both of them getting that award. I happen to think that Keith Jarrett's trio with Jack DeJanette and Gary Pika, and by the way, I wish Jack DeJanette had been there to give the award to Keith Jarrett, but uh, for one reason or another, he wasn't available to come to the program. But I happen to think that that trio 
which, which has been together for over 30 years now, is one of the quintessential piano, bass, and drums trios in the history of this music. So on that basis alone, I would support Keith Jarrett being a part of, of this pantheon. And, you know, from my own, uh, my own jazz history, uh, the first time I ever saw Keith Jarrett and Jack DeJanet was with Charles Lloyd at Oberlin College back in the 60s. And that is an indelible memory for me. And uh, so, you know, I, I definitely supported Keith Jarrett getting that honor. Now, Keith Jarrett's prickly personality, that's another matter entirely. But that shouldn't intrude upon his musical excellence. No, in fact, one of my first uh, <coughs> favorite recordings was Forest Flower in 1966, yes, the Charles Lloyd Quartet Live at the Monterey Jazz Festival. Uh, Keith Jarrett's piano solo on, on uh, Forest Flower just jumped out of the speakers. I mean, it's still one of my favorite solos. And of course, Keith, uh, after uh, Charles Lloyd, uh, played with Miles Davis, a completely different direction. He was in the band with Gary Bartz and Michael Henderson and Jack DeJanet uh, playing electric music, which is something he really hasn't done since then. Well, you know, I like the way he characterizes that. How does he characterize uh, it? Well, we all know that he abhors electronic instrumentation. But he took that job with Miles Davis knowing full well that that's what Miles needed and wanted was another electric keyboard player. And as he says, it's very simple. That was his way of play, of getting an opportunity to play with Miles Davis and come hell or high water, come Fender Rhodes or whatever, I'm going to play with Miles Davis. And he had that experience. Well, he certainly did. And you can see that band on a number of, uh, a number of videos on uh, YouTube. There was some, some documentation. And after that, uh, he did two things. He started doing a lot of solo concerts, mm -hmm. uh, many, many recordings of solo piano. And he also formed what I think was one of his best groups. I think one of the best groups of the era in the 70s. With, uh, it was a quartet with Dewey Redman, Charlie Hayden, and uh, Paul Motion. I had a great to, band. to see them at Slugs a number of times and, you know, some fantastic music. So I've been listening to Keith for decades. I thought his acceptance speech was in a way like one of his piano solos. Where <laughs> in he what was way? Like, he was pulling in unexpected elements at different places, and then he would go back to them. He started out saying, I forget his exact language, but something, music can't well, be... Not, it was, well, it was also, it, he also started out with a, uh, a, a, a bit of a snarky comment related to the fact that I'm not going to go on as long as my predecessors did on this stage. But then he proceeded to go on. Yeah. And, well, he said he started out saying... He was very thoughtful and he said, well, music can't be described in words, yes. but I'm going to do that anyway. Right. And, uh, but one thing that was interesting about Keith Jarrett, he was the only one who thanked his mother. I thought that yes, was very, very touching. Yes, he did. Well, let's think about that. Uh, he's probably, he may very well be the only one whose mother is still alive. You know, because he did, he did say that his mother is 94 years old. Right. And, st and, and still very much alive. He may be the only one whose mother is still on the planet. Yeah. But yeah, he did. And, and you know, of course, thanking mom is, is, is always uh, high on the list. Well, Keith Jarrett was something of a child prodigy, and it was his mother who encouraged him uh, at a very young age, three years old, four years old, to, to play music. He obviously had a talent for it mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Pennsylvania. The, Allentown, uh, to be Allentown, exact. Allentown, Pennsylvania, to be exact. Uh, mm -hmm. First gigs with Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians. Yes. An entirely different genre. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, uh, Bill Frizzell and uh, Jason and Moran. Jason Moran. Played uh, one of his Keith's, uh, Keith pieces. was excellent. Then the program... And, 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 now, hold on. Okay. Did, did you dig Keith Jarrett's demeanor while they were playing that piece? He seemed to be enjoying it. He was sitting at just a few rows in front of me, and I watched him. And he was deep into what they were doing. And after Jason Moran and Bill Frizzell finished playing his piece, which they did beautifully, he stood up. He gave them a standing ovation. 
And so, you know, he's not the kind of guy who, who would give that up easily. So I guess Bill Frisell and Jason Moran must have done right by his piece of music. Well, to, uh, Bill Frisell and Jason Moran are two exceptional musicians. Absolutely. Who are, uh, not in the household, category, household name category, but certainly are two of the most accomplished and uh, uh, changing musicians uh, that I know. Two okay. musicians, two two musicians who, if this program, uh, Lord willing, survives, uh, are likely to be on that stage at some point in their lives. Absolutely, uh, Bill yeah. uh, uh, probably uh, sooner than Jason. Jason's a little younger. Jason's not, Jason's now the artistic director for jazz at the Kennedy Center, right? Yes, he is, and doing some wonderful work there. Has the has it changed uh, since the Bailey Taylor days and and what they're presenting now that Jason is in charge? Yeah, it has changed in some respect. Uh, he presented Braxton, and he played with Braxton on the evening that he presented Braxton. Uh, he had Cecil Taylor booked. Uh, Cecil, for some one reason or another, didn't play the gig, and Ahmad Jamal Trio replaced Cecil. But, uh, you know, we love Billy Taylor, but those kinds of things weren't happening under Billy Taylor's tenure. And I'll tell you another interesting thing that Jason has done at the Kennedy Center. He has taken it upon himself, you know, because of his age and his contemporaries and where he comes from, he's taken it upon himself to try and invite a younger audience to jazz programs at the Kennedy Center. So what they did was they took an atrium. If you're familiar with the Kennedy Center, on the upper level of the Kennedy Center, in between the Terrace Theater and the two restaurants, there's a huge atrium. So they converted that huge atrium into a performance space, a stand-up perform a, a performance space where the audience stands. And uh, what he has done is booked and presented artists who appeal to an audience that has no problem with standing at a gig, a younger audience. And so the first gig they presented was Modesky, Martin, and Wood. And they took no prisoners in their performance, but they had a young audience, and the young audience with their drinks in hand, with their smartphones in hand, tweeting and going through social media as the performance is going on, taking pictures and the like, very loose atmosphere. The audience loved them. Uh, he's presented Soul Live there. Uh, he's presented his Jason Moran's Fast Waller project. And coming up, he's going to have the Robert Glasper experiment playing in that space. So in that way, he's bringing a new audience to jazz at the Kennedy Center that hadn't previously existed. So they have that space. And then, of course, there's the Kennedy Center Jazz Club and uh, the Terrace Theater. And uh, they have a very lively jazz program at the Kennedy Center. Uh, and I think that Jason Moran has followed in the tradition of Billy Taylor and uh, continued to raise the contemporary level of what they do there. Well, in terms of uh, younger musicians, uh, uh, Melissa Aldana, who won the Monk competition last year, was featured in the final number of the program with Jimmy Heath. He seemed to be very enthusiastic oh, about hold, it. Hold, hold up, Brett. Oh, hold on. She also played with Ann Hampton Calloway. <laughs> oh, I forgot. You're right. She did. Well, go but, ahead. But uh, Jimmy was very enthusiastic about her playing, and I think deservedly so. I, th I think she's a, a wonderful player. How was she, she received? Has, she has a beautiful tone. Okay, let's start there. She just has a gorgeous tone on that tenor. And uh, uh, she, I think she was very well received. I can, I can see why. I was very impressed by her playing. So overall, uh, a great show. Here's a link now that you can uh, click on and, and watch the entire program and make up your own mind about uh, Anne Hampton Calloway and uh, the long speeches. And uh, we'll have to wait till next year to sh see a show like this. As we mentioned at the top of the show, there is another awards show called the Jazz Journalist Association Awards. But that is not really, in a way that it started out in the late 90s as a uh, much more uh, expansive presentation, so to speak. 
Uh, I remember the first couple of years, one year it was at Alice Tully Hall. I think uh, Michael Dorff might have been associated with that. Since then, uh, the Jazz Journalists Association Awards, although it's a, a, a celebration, the event itself is, is, is not particularly noteworthy. Why do you think that is, Willard? Well, I, I, you know, I, I can't agree that it's not noteworthy. Uh, I, I think it is noteworthy because of the nature of the event and because, you know, you talk about few opportunities for jazz artists to be honored. <laughs> there are even fewer opportunities for those working in the trenches, i.e. in jazz journalism, to be honored. So, so there's always a nice fraternal feeling in the house there. It's, 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 it's a lower key event than it was when it first started. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, 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 an afternoon event, like a matinee event held at the Blue Note. And uh, it has its charms. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be so quick to put it down. It does have its charms. Well, I just question the value of the Jazz Journalists Association. Uh, first of all, one man uh, is kind of in charge of it. It's hardly a democracy. Uh, Howard Mandel, who certainly his heart is in the right place. But I wonder, why does he maintain control of the organization? It's like, you know, Haile Selassie was the emperor of Ethiopia his entire life. Howard Mandel is going to be the president of the Jazz Journalists Association his entire life. What do you think about that? What, what, what James Brown say? Can't touch that. You know, I'm one of the founding members of the Jazz Journalists Association. I applaud the work Howard Mandel has done to maintain the organization and keep its head above waters. You know, but there is some there's some truth to what you say about the lack of democracy in that regard. Uh, I think, but I think you'll have to uh, you're going to put Howard Mandel on the grill uh, to get to that issue. I'm not the right person to respond to those questions. Okay, well, you were a founder of the organization. Do you have I any? Was. Do you have any input as to as as to uh, how its mission is being carried out? Are you you yourself involved with the awards? No, and I'm not part. I'm, I'm I'm involved with the awards in two ways. First off, I was uh, very privileged and pleased to be an honoree this past year, uh, and I'm also a voting member of Jazz Journalists Association. So I'm one of those who vote on the awards every year. So in, in that respect, I am involved with the organization. I'm a paid voting member of the JJA. However, I am in no way involved in the governing operations of the Jazz Journalists Association. So that aspect, I can't touch it. Okay, well, my only comment would be, I wish it was a more dynamic organization, uh, had greater uh, face value, so to speak. People knew about it, more of an advocate's role. I find it to well, be it's like- Well, it's, it's, it's time to do a hang with Howard Mandel. Well, if he would agree to come on, uh, perhaps we'll have uh, Mr. Mandel as a guest. But uh, it's kind of a limp, uh, uh, limp uh, dish towel uh, from my perspective. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, we've covered a bit of territory here about the NEA Jazz Masters. Once again, uh, click on this link and watch the show yourself and make your own judgments. Uh, any idea, Willard, uh, whom next year's Jazz Masters might be? No. And, uh, you know, Wayne Brown is one of those people who always kept things close to the vest, and that's the NEA. Uh, that's their stance. That's their policy. So you and I will know at the same time. I have no idea. And uh, for 2015, they haven't been selected yet. That doesn't happen, that doesn't happen until uh, later in the year. Okay, well, there are many deserving individuals, uh, certainly. Yes, yeah, so, so, so I urge, you know, I, I saw you and others posted on Facebook about certain individuals that you thought were deserving of the award. There are always people who are deserving of this award. I just urge anyone who's watching this to go to the NEA Jazz Masters website and follow the nomination process. All it is is a simple one-page letter and uh, nominate your Jazz Masters of Choice and see what happens. Okay, well, maybe somebody will vote for you, Willard. Is that possible? 
Maybe they'll vote for the jazz video guy. Who knows? Anything is possible in this world. This is Brett Premack. I want to thank my friend Willard Jenkins for joining me today on Jazz Talk Squared.